June 5th, 2005, I received the phone call that every parent dreads. Your son has been in a terrible car accident. Come now. Ned was 22 years old and a senior at the University of Arizona in Tucson, where he was studying public relations and communications. He was the total athlete, handsome, engaging guy, his whole great future ahead of him. I knew at that moment when that phone call came that our lives were never going to be the same. And he said, Ms. Rogers, you should have no reasonable expectation of your son being able to talk, walk, move, or have any cognitive capability ever again. Wow, that was, you know, pretty tough. Not to be able to talk, not be able to scream. Here you'd be, like just lying, you couldn't move, nothing. We had had to resort to this absolutely arcane way of communicating. It was sort of a cross between hangman and wheel of fortune, but about life and death, an alphabet card. So right in front of him, we would take the alphabet card, I would run my finger along the lines of the letters until we got to a letter that he wanted to identify. And so you'd get to the H and he'd blink. We have a little piece of paper and we'd write H down, just like in Hangman. Then we'd start again, and we'd have to go again, and he would get to I. Immediately write down. And I'm waiting, for, I'm like this, and then he's blinking like this. I'm realizing, oh my gosh, he's saying hi. <laughs> All of that to say hi. Listen, if it had been me, I would have been, you know, like yanking things up. Poor guy, it was so challenging, despite all odds. This kid somehow was able to find it in his, and this is like really unheard of, to have that high of an injury to breathe on air, and he got off the ventilator. And with that, the next thing we heard, rehab. And one day, they introduced us to an organization in Atlanta called Canine Assistance. In walks this trainer and this gorgeous, beautiful black lab, impeccably trained, who had been trained, in fact, to provide assistance to individuals in wheelchairs. He had been trained to get somebody across the street, to protect him if somebody was jostling him. And I was like, yes, Ned, this is wonderful. This dog is going to be awesome for you. Look out, he's gorgeous, this is going to be great. And all Ned said, sort of rolled his eyes at me and went, we have dogs. Well. We do have dogs. Well, and you know we have dogs. Okay, let's be serious. These are two Pomeranian Chihuahua mutts. They yap, they yip, they bark, they nip at your heels, they, they pee everywhere. These are silly, silly dogs. And I'm like, please don't mistake our dogs for this impeccably trained dog. He didn't care. He turned his head, he didn't care. And I blurted out, monkey! And Ned and the nurse that was in the room looked at me, really? I said, no, come on, I'm serious. Don't you remember there was something on 60 Minutes a couple of years ago about a nonprofit organization that was training monkeys to help disabled individuals? And I'm looking at the nurse from Shepherd thinking, well, sure, she's going to be, right, yeah. And looked at Ned, and Ned's going, Mom, you are just way ahead of yourself here. And I, you know, fine, fine, fine. I left, went back to the hotel room, and one of the things that I looked forward to every day, we were there for a very long time, was I looked forward when I got back to the hotel room to sit down at my laptop and to open my email. And it was always so wonderful to have emails from my family and my, you know, all my friends and my friends. Let me just point out to you that these friends of mine, they took care of my kids. They took care of my house. They swept the floors. They brought food. They took my younger girls to soccer or to softball. 
I don't know what I would have been able to have done without these people because they took care of everything, and my everything, while I was either in a in Mass General pretty much 24-7 Arizona or in Atlanta. So I couldn't wait to come back to the hotel to see the emails. That, their friend, they had friends that sent prayers. Their friends of friends sent prayers. Friends of friends of friends were sending prayer. But that evening, when I opened up the email, there wasn't an email, in fact. The first one was not from my mom, and it wasn't from my sister, and it wasn't from my neighbor. It was from my girl's middle school, Sanborn Middle School in Concord, Massachusetts. Dear parent, Please join us this Friday for our children's assembly where Helping Hands Monkey Helpers for the Disabled will be coming. <laughs> so, you know, I, I what, you know, how'd that happen? You know, I, I still get a little prickly about the whole thing. You know, I like to think it was divine intervention, but I have to tell you from that moment on, I was gonna get a monkey helper for Ned. It started, actually, as a joint venture with Boston University and the Department of Defense to investigate whether primates could be helpful to uh, veterans that came home that were severely disabled. And over a period of the first few years with doing the research, they identified the capuchin monkey as being the best served for this particular purpose. Capuchins are small monkeys. They're between six and eight pounds, generally speaking, so you could have them in your house. It would be about the same as having a small dog. They are the smartest of the, monkey, of the New World monkeys. Capuchins got their name from a, the Spanish settlers that came over, and the, the, actually some of the people that came to conquer the New World. And when these soldiers saw these monkeys with their little tufts. It reminded them of the capuchin monks back in Spain. So they named this particular species of monkeys the cap capuchin monkeys. In addition to their being the smartest of the New World monkeys, these monkeys are also one of uh, probably the most dexterous of any of them. They have hands just like you and me, and guess what? Their feet have opposable toes. And that means they can use their feet just like you and I can use their hands. And then they got this tail that is like a whole nother limb. And one of the most interesting things, like, can I just tell you, like I knew nothing about this before? And, and I, you know, I'm sitting here telling you all this as if I know what I'm talking about. But I knew nothing about monkeys before. After the monkeys are about five years old, they are brought back to Boston where they go to, of course, where would you go in Boston, but to monkey college. And they go to college and for anywhere between four and five years. And it is here where these monkeys are taught through a very basic, fundamentally simple process called monkey see, monkey do. They learn to perform many, many simple tasks. They learn how to turn off and on the lights, they learn how to put a CD in a CD player to get a water bottle out of the fridge and bring the water bottle over, open it up, put a straw in and give it to the recipient. How about they learn how to push your glasses up on the end of your nose. They learn how to turn pages of a book. All these are simple and small things. We all take them for granted until we can't. And these monkeys are donated to recipients, totally at no cost to them, to be brought in to act as an extra set of hands. This is why they're called, it's called Helping Hands, Monkey, for the help, monkey Helpers for the Disabled. This incredible golden magic monkey myth. This monkey was going to solve all our problems. She was going to be Ned's best friend. She was going to bring him Cokes and she was gonna get him a pizza and she was gonna and she was gonna be each one of us had her own secret little fantasy. She was gonna be our personal best monkey pet. So she comes in and they let her, they, they bring her out of her little thing and she everybody gasps and she is so beautiful. She is the most beautiful monkey I who would have said, thought I'd be standing here at the Nantucket Athenaeum telling you how beautiful our monkey is? She's really a beautiful monkey. 
She's an Argentinian monkey, and she has a beautiful golden coat, and she has these cute little tufts, and she's these very elegant, aristocratic cheekbones. Let me just tell you something. I thought that I had done, remember? I'm somebody who thinks she's done everything and she's felt everything before. So I'm thinking all this time, all right, I have five kids, assorted boyfriends, assorted girlfriends, a whole bunch of dogs, a pony or two. How difficult could a monkey be? I was really wrong. Monkeys are incredibly sophisticated. They are just as sophisticated as you and you and you. They are really, really smart. And we got this monkey, she comes in, and it was just as if we had adopted a three-year-old from Chechnya. She was really cute and really adorable, but we didn't understand a word each other was saying, and let's face it, we were culturally worlds apart. And we couldn't believe what happened to us. Who knew that monkeys have an incredible, incredible hierarchy that they live in, in the jungle? It's how they survive. These, these two, this Ned and this Casey, I gotta give the both of them a lot of credit. You know, they believed when I doubted. And as Ned started to understand Casey, and started to realize and see this is a really smart individual. This, this little monkey was so intuitive and so intelligent and so capable, he began to respect her for who she was. And as she started to respect him, as he started to respect her, she then started to respect him. I tell you that Ned has made incredible progress. You know, we think back, you know, just a few minutes ago, the prognosis was so terrible. He was never going to walk. He was never going to talk. He was never going to eat. He was never going to breathe on his own. He wasn't going to have cognitive capability. And I'm so delighted to tell you that today, hands, all 10 fingers move, he types, he texts, he goes on Facebook, he eats everything. He can now, he wiggles his toes and he can even do a couple little kicks with his legs. He has defied every single doctor's prognosis, every single person that we met along the way. He wouldn't give up. And you know what? At the end of the day, it was all because we had hope. It was all because we saw that little twig of hope, that little tiny slender root of hope and opportunity, and we grabbed onto it. And no matter how ridiculous it seemed to take him to Atlanta, or how outrageous it was to get a helping monkey, or how far-fetched and seriously out of reach for me to write a book about our family story. We grabbed on to those opportunities as well. Opportunity, and Claudia and I were talking about this today. Sometimes in our really bleak time, Hope and opportunity are really hard to see. Our vision is really clouded, and our sorrow and despair has taken us over. Each one of us here in this room has had our own tragedies. Each one of us has had our own loss and have felt our own deep despair. But I'm here to tell you that there is hope and opportunity for every one of us. But you, you have to be open to it. You have to, and believe me when I tell you this, it's really hard not to see it. You have to tell yourself that there's hope. You have to command yourself that there's hope and there's opportunity. You have to believe 
that there's that hope and that opportunity. And I believe the good then will surely follow. Thank you. Thank you very much.